Every individual man or woman is the manager and chief executive of one of the most amazing organizations on earth, the complex of body, mind, and spirit which constitute the human organism, an assemblage of 639 separate muscles and 222 separate bones, each of which is so tough it can bear three times more weight than granite rock can without cracking or crumbling. But most importantly of all, each individual is unique. Just as mathematicians have found that the 52 playing cards in a deck can be arranged or shuffled into literally trillions and trillions of different combinations, so likewise are there virtually unnumberable varieties of ways in which the special talents, insights, abilities, and strong points of any individual man or woman can be reordered and so structured as to apply to a vast diversity of problems or situations and to begin to utilize the full spectrum of one's incredible, God-given human potentials is an intriguing, absorbing, and exhilarating challenge. An 80-year-old Swiss writer once decided to calculate and itemize all the activities of his lifetime. Among his findings were these, that he had spent nearly 27 years just sleeping, six years eating, 228 days shaving, 21 years working, over five years waiting for people, and nearly two solid weeks just keeping his pipe lit. A human lifetime is composed of two elements, time and energy. But it is in the mind and in the inner life, in the domains of psychology, philosophy, and religion, that the individual determines how these two aspects of time and energy, which are your human lifetime, are to be consumed. William Gladstone, four times Prime Minister of Britain, spoke these words in a speech to school children in 1877. Be inspired with the belief that life is a great and noble calling, not a mean and groveling thing that we are to shuffle through as we can, but an elevated and lofty destiny. In that attitude lie the seeds of human greatness, for God created human beings to live in vital and dynamic faith and hope. But in order for there to be effective achievement in the outer life, there must be kinetic motivation in the inner life, and thus the vast importance of a psychologically sound spiritual philosophy of life. First of all, begin by considering some of the practical standards and criteria of effective day-by-day -day lifestyle management and applied psychology. The American Mental Health Association has compiled a list of nine traits or qualities which doctors agree are the basic essentials for good mental health. Number one, a tolerant and easygoing attitude both toward yourself and toward others. Number two, a realistic estimation of your own personal abilities combined with a deep determination to make the most of them. Number three, self-respect and a personal pride in accomplishment, a self-respect independent of the judgment of other people. Number four, the ability to handle disappointment, to take it in stride without giving up. Number five, the ability to love and unselfishly to consider the interests of other people. Six, the ability to feel that you're part of the group and with a clear sense of your responsibility to the others in the group. Seven, an ability to solve problems as they arise without constantly procrastinating and putting off dealing with them until tomorrow or next week. Number eight, the ability to plan ahead and set realistic goals and the ability to think about the future without worrying about it, forethought without distraught consternation. And finally, number nine, putting your best into whatever you're doing and permitting yourself to enjoy the satisfaction of accomplishing tasks. For in the words of the philosopher Goethe, there is no happiness without wise effort. The cultivation of these nine traits or qualities of mental health in liaison with an affirmative and forward-looking spiritual philosophy of life will release an entire series of new discoveries in the realms of one's God-given human potentials. The map draftsmen and chart makers believe that there are still portions of the open oceans and the seas where no ships have ever sailed, and with reefs and entire islands which have never in known human history been thoroughly mapped. And so it is similarly with the human mind and the human psychology each possesses fascinating, undiscovered potentials, all of which were best summarized by the greatest teacher in human history, who declared the kingdom of God is within you. A spark of divinity, an ember of eternity, indwells the mortal mind. And these human potentials are so inestimably great that one must never assume that 
The failings and pains of existence will annihilate them. G.K. Chesterton once wrote that an inconvenience, rightly considered, is an adventure. And whether one sees a difficulty as an adventure or as an inconvenience is strictly a matter of choice, philosophy, and perspective. But to become intrigued by the adventure of solving your daily problems can be a source both of interest and actual enjoyment. The psychologist Dr. Gardner Murphy described the psychologically healthy personality as, quote, one which utilizes effectively and without conflict all that it possesses. This intriguing adventure of utilizing the full extent of your intellectual, social, physical, emotional, and spiritual resources as a son or daughter of God is vital to exuberant living. Another aspect is an attitude of affirmative expectation. When one door closes, another door opens. But we so often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones which are opening before us. The living God has a plan and purpose for your human life, and the greatest adventure of all is seeking and finding and accomplishing that purpose. But what of the argument that the older one becomes, the less capable one becomes of learning new systems of behavior? Consider the research of Professor Thorndike of the New York Teachers College, who divided a group of 465 adults into three sections, making the division solely on the basis of age. In the first group, he placed youngsters still in their 20s, in the second, men and women in their 30s. And in the third group, people between 40 and 50. If all these groups were given the same tests, which group would show the greatest learning ability? The result, the group between 40 and 50 came out first in every test which was given, one of the most difficult of which was learning to write with the wrong hand. They even scored better than eight-year-olds at learning new patterns. Professor Thorndike then summarized the result of his investigation with these words. We have discovered that mature people can learn practically anything they want to. In every mental function, they are thoroughly plastic and teachable. In fact, the learning ability of older people is very nearly as great as the learning ability of young people at the highly favorable ages of 17, 18, and 19. End of quote. The knowledge that continuous learning and growth are possible is a tremendous stimulus to enthusiastic living in every pursuit of existence. And even death is but a momentary transition in an endless adventure of personal, spiritual discovery and growth. Creativity, too, is by no means the exclusive commodity of energetic youth. The U.S. Patent Office did a study to find during which decade of their lives most inventors developed the majority of their patents and completed the majority of their inventions. The answer, between the ages of 60 and 70. And the psychological momentum achieved by the sheer expectation of such future creativity is in itself a tonic to the mind and spirit. But the greatest stimulus to vital living is the spiritual quest for perfection, aligning and synchronizing the human mind with the divine plan of the ages within the mind of God. One central issue for any psychologically healthy individual is that of self-identity. Dr. James F. T. Budental of Stanford Research Institute once conducted a psychological study in quest of the one question which would reveal more about an individual personality than any other question. When his studies were completed, tabulated, and analyzed, it was found that the most revealing question which could be asked an individual consisted of the following three words. Who are you? Dr. Budental found that most individuals defined themselves in terms of what they do rather than in terms of who they are. In psychological field tests, the doctor and his associates at Stanford Research discovered that this three-word question, who are you, often induced novel self-scrutiny and elicited uncensored responses. Here are some examples. One man said, I'm married. I'm an insurance adjuster. A lady in a drugstore replied to the question, who are you, by saying, are you out of your mind of all the oddball questions I ever heard of? You're wasting your time with me. I have no intention of answering. The whole thing is ridiculous. A man at a filling station said, I'm a stockbroker, and well, let's see, I'm a Democrat, and I'm president of two civic organizations. A woman waiting for a bus replied, I guess I'm me. That's who I am. Who else? You're not putting me on, are you? You're really university investigators making a psychology survey? Okay, then. I'm supposed to give three answers to the question, who am I? Well, number two, I'm a housewife. Number three, I have three children and a husband who's an engineer. Note, she described herself first as herself, secondly, by what she did, and thirdly, by what her husband did. 
The man in the grocery store answered, Who am I? Is that a serious question? I don't know who I am. Who does? I'm a frustrated fragment of humanity, he said. I'm also a bookkeeper. I have two children, a wife, and two mortgages. Dr. Bugentel's study emphasized the essential task of coming to terms with oneself. But the highest possible definition or understanding of the self is as a son or daughter of the living God, a brother or a sister to every other person on this planet. One therapist has written, most of us are like snowflakes trying to be like each other, yet knowing that no two snowflakes are ever identical. If we were to devote the same amount of energy in trying to discover the true self that lies buried deep within our own natures, we would all work harmoniously with life instead of forever fighting it and struggling against it. End of quote. Psychologists advise, in assessing yourself, give an honest appraisal of your particularly unique aspects of personality and behavior, and seek to define yourself not merely in terms of what you do, but of who you are. Consider well that genetically and in personality, background, and experiences, there is not another individual identical to you or to any of us on earth. Enter into the stimulating experience of studying the great thinkers and what they thought about human nature and destiny. For without this sort of transcendent spiritual perspective, one cannot ascend to the vision of life which has characterized the greatest of the men and women who have lived. The ceaseless explorations of science, philosophy, and religion are marvelous satisfactions to the mind and soul. One philosopher has stated that small-minded individuals think primarily about people and things, whereas large-minded individuals think more about ideas and ideals. But unless a person committedly insists upon creating placid periods in the day and in the week for such profound and reflective thinking, one shall not attain to it. And soon months and years are passing by and one's deepest needs for this are being systematically neglected and the inner life becomes weakened and enfeebled. Yet it is from this creative inner life that the noblest powers of the greatest of men and women in history have emerged. However it be practiced, and be it described as meditation, contemplation, reflection, or prayer and worship, this cultivation of spiritual insight is fundamental to a satisfying lifestyle. So important is this aspect that Emerson wrote of it, a man is what he thinks about all day long. And again he wrote, the key to every man is his thought. And the scriptures word it, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. One great need of this age is for an exalted philosophic vision. As one observer has said it, the society which scorns excellence in plumbing because plumbing is an humble activity and tolerates shoddiness in philosophy because it is an exalted activity will have neither good plumbing nor good philosophy. Neither its pipes nor its theories will hold water. Human life is indeed a difficult enterprise, but human beings possess three fundamental techniques for dealing with difficulties thinking, humor, and faith. First, creative and concentrated thinking can unravel countless of the most snared and tangled human difficulties. Second, humor is essential. Abraham Lincoln was criticized for reading joke books during the height of the Civil War, but he replied, if I do not laugh, I shall die. Humor serves both as an emotional safety valve and as a tremendous enrichment of human life. It is a vital asset. Over a century ago, the preacher Henry Ward Beecher said, a life without humor is like a wagon without springs. Psychologists at the University of Massachusetts have found that people who made the highest scores on sense of humor tests also scored highest on tests of their practical, rational abilities. They tended to be the most reasonable individuals, the easiest to get along with, and had the best insights into their own personalities. A good sense of humor and good psychological health are proven to go hand in hand. The ability to laugh is one of God's choicest gifts to humankind. Dr. James V. McConnell, professor of psychology at the University of Michigan, has written that the sheer physical act of smiling has been proven in and of itself to improve the mental attitude of the person who is smiling and has found that individuals who smile more than the average tend to be more successful and effective both in their work and in their lives. 
Dr. William F. Fry, Jr., professor of psychiatry at Stanford University, says people who find it difficult to laugh at themselves are frequently very defensive and depressed. They begin to feel put upon, hurt, and offended. People who easily laugh at themselves, on the other hand, are secure and comfortable. Their self-respect is intact. He further elaborates that laughter is known to stimulate the muscles, circulation, brain activity, and hormone production, and finds that the best way to learn the secret of laughter is to look for the, quote, absurd, unexpected, inconsistent, and therefore laughable aspects of every experience. Dr. Wallace Wallen called laughter a magic touchstone against worry and frayed nerves, a prime characteristic of the healthy personality. In review, three great techniques for dealing with human problems are thinking, humor, and finally, faith. Faith is an enduring source spring of spiritual and psychological energy, hope and happiness. The inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, wrote that man alone among the animals is not content merely with the satisfaction of his physical and material needs, but that man above all needs something to believe in. The greatest ideas in the history of human thought worth believing in are the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, that the kingdom of God is within the individual, that God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for human life and eternal life beyond this life for those who will live by eternal values, truth and beauty and goodness, and seeking to be perfect, even as the Father in heaven is perfect. Psychologists recognize two fundamental types of motivation in human beings, internal and external. External motivations are such rewards as economic success, material wealth, etc. Internal rewards and motivations are concerned with meanings and values, the quest for a higher purpose, self-actualization, and spiritual fulfillment. The famed psychologist Dr. Abraham H. Maslow formulated a widely accepted list which is known as the hierarchy of needs, in which the priorities of human needs are listed. As each of the more basic needs is met, the next higher need is sought by the individual. The higher a culture or a civilization advances, the higher the needs which are sought to be satisfied. The most basic needs, according to Maslow, are the material survival necessities. He lists the following. Number one, basic physical needs such as sleep, food to eat, water to drink, etc. Number two, safety and security, secure lodging, food storage, police protection, pension programs, insurance, economic security, all those fell under this category. Three, the third need is belonging and social needs. This is the requirement for interpersonal association, friendship, fellowship, community feelings, and love. Number four, esteem and status. This is the need to feel worthwhile as an individual and to feel that others think that we are valuable to be recognized and appreciated. And finally, number five, the fifth great need is for self-actualization and fulfillment. This is the highest need listed on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It has to do with becoming all that one is capable of becoming, utilizing the full extents of one's individual human potentials. This includes the need for an inner spiritual satisfaction in life, and it goes far beyond the realm of psychology. This fifth need enters the realms both of philosophy and of religion. And some of the most advanced and workable teachings known to humankind in this realm of the highest need, self-actualization and fulfillment, are to be found in the spiritual insights and philosophic teachings of the advanced thinkers of world history. The concept that the individual is not an aimless accident, but is a child of the universe, a son or daughter of God, and a brother or sister to every other person in the entire human family, that the incessant quest for perfection, that divine discontent which has motivated so many of the greatest of the human race, that this all is a God-given gift for the inspiration and exhilaration of problem-solving and decision-making. And this is fundamental to a fully exuberant philosophy of life. These qualities and satisfactions of the inner life are largely independent of the circumstances and inequities of the outer life. The publishing executive Wilfred Funk wrote the following reminder of the fact that even serious physical problems are not necessarily impediments to achievement. He wrote, 
Take a look at these famous men and the handicaps that failed to slow them. The poet Lord Byron had a club foot. Robert Louis Stevenson and John Keats had tuberculosis. Charles Steinmetz and Alexander Pope were hunchbacks. Admiral Nelson had only one eye. Edgar Allan Poe was psychoneurotic. Charles Darwin, an invalid. Julius Caesar was an epileptic. And Thomas Edison and Ludwig von Beethoven were deaf. But to great individuals, disappointments become challenges, handicaps become hurdles to run, and frustrations but spur the individual to greater effort. When University of California psychologists studied the subjects of optimism and pessimism in a wide-scale survey, they concluded, quote, too often we find that pessimism is little more than a perverse rationalization for lazy or comfortable inactivity or irresponsibility. The pessimist, belittling the likelihood of progress, adds obstacles to practical accomplishments and facilitates the very failure he anticipates. Basically and practically, pessimism is a do-nothing, destructive attitude. End of quote. Psychologists have described an uncreative thinker as one who sees the problems in every opportunity, and a creative thinker as one who sees the opportunities in every problem. William Arthur Ward said to the optimist, all doors have handles and hinges. To the pessimist, only locks and latches. Intellectual belief and spiritual faith release enormous energies into human life. But these energies must be intelligently directed. Professor Mabel Newcomer of Vassar College once wrote, it is more important to know where you're going than to get there quickly. Do not mistake activity for achievement. Andrew Carnegie declared the average person puts 25% of his energy and ability into his work. The world takes off its hat to those who put in more than 50% of their capacity and stands on its head for those few and far between souls who devote 100%. Harvard medical professor William James wrote, compared to what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts, which he habitually fails to use. And Dr. Walter Dill Scott, noted psychologist and president emeritus of Northwestern University, wrote, it is more than probable that the average man could, with no injury to his health, increase his efficiency by 50%, end of quote. Living faith releases the full resources of the human mind and spirit. Dr. Nadine Ellis, a Colorado clinical psychologist, stresses the importance of developing a healthy self-esteem, which is independent of the judgment of others. She writes, start by changing the things you say about yourself. Never say, I'm too dumb to do that, or I could never succeed at that. And she, too, along with numerous other psychologists, also warns that one must, quote, guard against an unconscious tendency to set a goal so high as to ensure failure. It has been clinically proved that some individuals literally fear success because of the demands and responsibilities attendant to it. The late Dr. Charles Mayo of the famed Mayo Clinic said that fear alone is capable of producing serious disease. Dr. George W. Cryle, well-known Cleveland surgeon, said in his book, The Origin and Nature of Emotions, quote, fear is overwhelming. We fear not in our hearts alone, not in our brains alone, not in our viscera alone, but in every organ and tissue of the body. Yet in the frequently quoted words of the late psychiatrist Dr. William S. Sadler of Chicago, the only known cure for fear is faith and declared the greatest teacher of them all, have faith in God. One vitally important aspect of a satisfying and productive lifestyle is a total balance of the various elements. One psychiatrist has said that whenever he's dealing with a patient with anxiety and nervous irritability, he always asks the patient if he plays golf. The doctor says if the patient says no, I tell him to start. If he says yes, I tell him to stop. Discovering an ideal balance between work and relaxation, between vocation and recreation, is an individual matter. But it is of extreme importance. He who will not make time for relaxation must eventually make time for illness. Consider another balancing aspect of life. Dr. Nathan Ackerman, a psychiatrist specializing in family relations, states, the single most encompassing reason 
for our conspicuous failure thus far to prevent mental illness derives from our failure to cope with the mental health problems of family life. A loving and supportive family relationship is important to optimum life function. And so is the element of hope and a positive future philosophy. And another instance of the psychology of the self-fulfilling prophecy, an affirmative attitude of mind will tend to create more positive reactions and relationships. The unequivocally held conviction that all human beings on this earth are children of God, are valuable, are spiritual brothers and sisters, will in turn reflect those higher meanings and values into every circumstance and relationship of daily living. Another psychologist, Professor W.I. Thomas, has established what psychology now calls the Thomas Theorem, which is the following, quote, if you define a situation as real, it becomes real in its consequences. For example, if you define yourself in your own mind as worthless, you will then begin to act and react and think of yourself and behave as if you were worthless. You have defined that situation as real and it has become thus real in its consequences in your life. If, conversely, you define your situation differently and yourself differently, if you define your situation as that of being valuable in the universe, a personality of power and potential with momentous reasons for being alive, for breathing each breath of air, that definition will likewise become real in its consequences. An occasion comes to mind in which I was once invited to be the guest lecturer in a high school psychology class in Los Angeles. In order to illustrate these principles, such as the W.I. Thomas theorem, I outlined two opposing self-definitions and asked the students to think through the consequences of each definition. I said, suppose you thought of yourself or defined yourself as worthless, a non-essential, mere evolutionary excrescence of the universe without any reason or destiny, that you were a mere planetary biological accident without a soul, without a spiritual dimension. Suppose you thought of yourself that way. Suppose you defined yourself in that fashion. What would your behavior tend to be? The students, assuming that premise for a moment, answered that life would probably feel futile and frustrating. One would spend little energy in loving and relating unselfishly to others. That one would tend to be egocentric, depressed, purposeless, unhappy with that view of oneself. But then I said to the class, now consider the opposite view. You have just analyzed how you would feel, act and react, if you held the lowest possible definition of yourself and of your place in the universe. But now consider how you would feel, act and react if you held the highest reasonable view of yourself and your place in the universe. Imagine that you held a concept firmly in your mind, that you were a son or daughter of the universe, a child of God, that all eternity lay before you, an endless Star Trek from here to the center of infinity. Suppose, I ask this high school psychology class, suppose that you held that view of yourself. How then would you feel, act, and react if that were your self-concept? Immediately, the students began to raise their hands, and several were practically bouncing in their chairs, eager to describe how one would feel believing that. It would be a positive way to live, they said. There would be a feeling of reason in being alive, an ability to love and to serve more unselfishly, a sense of progress and dynamism day by day. Remember again the W.I. Thomas theorem, quote, if you define a situation as real, it becomes real in its consequences, end of quote. The Harvard psychologist Eric Erickson once described the most consequential turning point in all of human life as the identity crisis. That is the point at which a person asks and answers for himself this three-word question, who am I? Many psychologists believe the way one answers that question, who am I, is the determination of the remainder of that individual's life. It is the most consequential question you ever ask, and the answer you give to it is the most consequential answer you will ever give. And the highest possible answer is that one is infinitely valuable, that you are an irreplaceable personality, a son or daughter of the living God, and a brother or a sister to all the peoples of this good green planet Earth, indwelt each one by sparks of divinity, the living essence of the living God.